Hello, everyone. And um, I think I'm going to get us started. Um, I'm Julie Segre, um, and it's a pleasure, really, to see you all and welcome you today to the first of the NHGRI seminars for this cal fiscal calendar year. Um, and it will be really a pleasure to start to see people again and appreciate everyone who came today um, to hear this remarkable seminar from our colleague, Sean Kimbrough. Um, Sean is the director of the Julius Chambers Biomedical and Biotechnology Research Institute at North Carolina Central University. They were fortunate um, uh, to have formed an alliance and recruited him. Um, as you see, the title of his talk today is The Biology of Health Disparities, Ancestry-Driven Drug Discovery. Uh, Dr. Kimbrough uh, has all of the uh, laudatory um, uh, recognition. He um, received his bachelor's at Wash U in St. Louis in 1987. I um, hope he didn't develop too much of an allegiance to that baseball team when he was there. He, um, <laughs> he then, uh, we have members who have that affinity in the audience. Um, he went on to get his PhD at Indiana University in Bloomington and uh, did a postdoc at Harvard Medical School and then a postdoc at NIEHS. His research focuses on the molecular characterization of hormonal cancers, prostate and breast cancers. Um, and these are cancers that disproportionately affect racial and ethnic groups, which is also a subject of his research. Um, so Dr. Cambro is uh, uh, very important in the field and has been recognized. He's uh, funded with an R a transformative R01 um, to research um, these uh, geographical ancestry-driven variants of immunity and their role in the biology of um, cancer and health disparities and also as part of the investigator development core at the NCCU, which um, he will hopefully also um, give us a little bit more information about as one of the really um, research focused HBCUs um, and, their, uh, and their accomplishments in implementing, implementing the cultivation of researchers focusing on important issues of minority health. That's been funded for many years and is viewed as a model. So today, uh, Sean's going to give us a talk um, that's really going to come up with uh, new solutions to old problems. So with that, welcome to NHGRI, and thank you for joining us. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a, a, a packed day. I've enjoyed uh, meeting a lot of the students and meeting some of the colleagues. I want to thank uh, the National, Na National Human Genome Research Institute uh, for having me come and speak. This is definitely an honor and a privilege. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Ariel Williams. Um, she's an alum of North Carolina Central University um, who's here, graduated from my laboratory. So I want to thank her very much. And Dr. Burgess and uh, Dr. Sergi, um, I appreciate your uh, introduction and your um, well comments. Um, I'll, and as, as once again, thank the students. Uh, I had a good lunch. We had a good time talking today uh, for lunch. So I appreciate that. Um, so what I'm going to do is get warmed up here. And um, I'm hoping to cover a couple of things. As the title implies, the biology of health disparities and ancestrally driven drug discovery. So this, I'm going to put this talk up to two pieces. Uh, first, I'm going to leave you with two themes. One, I want you to think about uh, health disparities and the biology and how we get to that, um, to the biology of the health disparities. Also, I want you to consider um, ancestry and how we can use that to investigate and identify novel drugs. So what I always do, first I'm gonna share, okay, let's see, can we do this? There we go. So I wanna start with this. This is my slide of, um, what is it called? Um, uh, <laughs> my advertisement. Um, but I'm from North Carolina Central U University. I'm gonna to come to this talk with a certain bias, 
Okay. Um, this is a historically black uh, college and university in North Carolina. It's a public university. Um, it is located in the Research Triangle Park. So when you think about Research Triangle Park, do not just think of the three schools that you always hear in football and basketball. There is also North Carolina Central University, and we do do research at that institution. Uh, we also have two institutes, as we mentioned, uh, Julius Chambers Biomedical Biotechnology Research Institute. Um, I was a pleasure of leading that for a couple of years. Uh, and there's also a biomedical, a biomanufacturing research institute and technology enterprise, which looks at actually drug development. And at this university, we have one of the largest uh, uh, depository of, of chemical um, um, drug bank um, donated by uh, Biogen. Over 500,000 compounds are in some freezers. So we have the capacity. So once you think about that, you'll keep that in mind. I also want you to understand my whole perspective, my whole talk is going to come from the perspective of a American descendant of enslaved Africans. That's my perspective. And that's why I bring to the table. Okay. And so from that perspective, I have a certain view and, and, and idea about what health disparities is. And I have a personal commitment to that topic. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is my laboratory. Everyone up here identifies as African American, every single one. They check the box. However, you see that they are quite different, okay? But they all would be Black or African American, okay? That's the question here. That's the power of ancestry versus the box, okay? And with that in mind, you have to ask, how do we get to this place? How do we get to this level of diversity? And how do we use that diversity to explain some phenomena that we see in health outcomes? So everyone's seen this picture of some version of it. And this is what we're all taught, of course, right? We realize that humans um, left out of um, Africa and they migrated out and walked across the land bridge and ended up in the America. So that was the natural trail of evolution. And if you notice the oldest population being in Africa and the new guys are the Europeans and the Americans, all right? Well, we know that that changes 400 years worth of slavery. And now you have to consider the other migration, okay? You have to consider that forced migration. That is what's not taught in school. And what is the biological impact of that, okay? What does that really look like? When you, when you move people from one location designed for Central Africa or uh, West Africa, and then those people are transported to Charleston, Virginia. I mean, sorry, Charleston, South Carolina, or to Savannah, Georgia, okay? That's not where they were three months ago or three weeks ago or four weeks ago. And yet you now move the whole group of people in a short period of time. And we're talking about up to 7 million people, okay? That's a lot of folks. That's not normal and not during that length of time. So therefore you don't have the, the opportunity of having selective pressures, that evolutionary impact of the selective pressure that would have occurred naturally. So with that in mind, you, you notice how I said natural selection, but let's talk about that unnatural selection. This is actually um, found this, um, in the literature, and this is actually a Englishman licking a slave's, a African's forehead to confirm his age of all things, uh, and whether or not he was salty, okay? This was one of the theories that, that was posed a long time ago in terms of the African gene theory. There was some uh, African, uh, the slavery uh, hypertension um, theory. And the idea being that there was a certain selection that went on before they got on the boat, and then there was a selection that occurred at those that survived the trip. Imagine the mental state of an individual that's packed on that boat. And I'm sure many of you have gone to the, to the museum downtown DC and you've seen that actual, how they pack those human beings in there. Imagine that. So imagine this is who you've selected for. That's selection. Okay, we may not like that because it doesn't fit the natural program that we've all been taught because you got 30% of those folks didn't make it. So that means you had to have a certain genotype probably to survive that. You definitely had a certain 
mental capacity to survive that type of treatment and then to land here in the United States. And now I'm not gonna talk about Brazil and the Caribbean, okay? Because my point of reference is right here in the United States, okay? So let's think about this. So we're talking about American descendants of enslaved Africans. And so that's different than someone who has immigrated here recently and might be one or two generations in. Okay, that's a different population, okay? So we talked about unnatural selection before and after the trip. We talk about that change in environment that occurred when he moved someone from Central Africa into North America. What the impact did you have on that, that individual? That person was not designed for Virginia or Georgia. They were designed for Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal. Okay, that's a different climate. They were optimized. I like to use the word when I, when I go out in the community, I use the word optimized, okay? You have a good example is Porsche and a, and a Jeep. A Porsche is designed to run around a track fast, right? Not designed to run around a sand and dunes or anything like that or in the forest, but that Jeep is designed to be used for rocky terrain and so forth. Genetically similar, right? They both have engines, combustible engines, but they're optimized differently, okay? I see some heads shaking, so someone's is making sense, okay? So at the end of the day, you have the per people that were designed for a particular environment, relocated them, well, let's back up. You selected for a certain type of person, whatever you thought they were doing, licking foreheads, right? But now you've got a population that also mentally made it. So now you have that population ending up in the Americas. And then you have something that's unique, to only America, to only the Americas and slave trade, and that's forced admixing. There is probably no other group of folks in the, on the planet that have been admixed with two divergent genomes than African-American. Think about that. Seven million Africans all in a short period of time, not thousands of years that other cultures have had or other peoples have had, but 400 years worth of people, seven million people or plus, and then since they were property, you had admixing of a European admixture, uh, ad, uh, a, a genotype mixed with an African genotype. Two divergent folks optimized for different, re, uh, different regions of the continent or the planet coming together in Virginia, in uh, um, North Carolina, Georgia, okay? Then you do something else. Then, life changes on you. So here I am, got a nice tan, right? Don't need a bunch of um, sunscreen, really. At least I wasn't designed that way, right? And I'm now designed to be outside. And so if I'm designed for that environment, now I'm inside with industrialization, okay? And then I got structural racism on top of that, which creates that chronic stress and that sedentary lifestyle, I now have a group of folks that are no longer designed for the current environment that they're in. Okay. That poses a problem. So if we think about these parameters together, now you can appreciate where some of these disparities might emanate from, okay? And of course, that's gonna change our behaviors and ultimately lead to difference in health, outcome, <clears throat> health outcomes. So, we talked about this in a publication um, in reference to cancer and the argument that allowed the uh, genetic variants that were coming out related to, um, and some of the transcriptome uh, work that was coming out was looking at and made observations that the innate immune system and immunity was one of the biggest differences between um, um, ethnic groups, okay? So we proposed that in, a, in an article in um, Cancer Immun uh, Immunological Research in 2019. That same idea, the idea being that you're optimized uh, with pathogens, that same thing goes with sickle cell, APOL1. These are uh, proteins that were modified for the purpose of protecting against malaria and other um, 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 pathogens. And because of that selective pressure, you end up with a certain immune profile, 
a genetic profile, and then that migration to the United States, you just lost your advantage. There was no need for that genetic profile here. And therefore, we now have a, 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 a disparity, uh, a health outcome that is reflective of the relocation, the admixing, and the selection of a group of people here in the Americas. This is further demonstrated. I just pulled out um, this couple of papers talking about um, this positive natural selection that occurred. And that's the selection that occurred through that nice traveling through the land bridges, not the one that occurred necessarily um, on the boats from West Africa, Africa to, to the Americas. And this idea that there's three areas that you see these uh, three biological um, pathways that are apparently impacted by positive um, natural selection, metabolism, immune function, and skin pigmentation, okay? So if you assume those three things and look at some of the disparities that we have right now, you'll, you can appreciate that metabolism and immune function can account for a lot of those issues that we see now, okay? If you really think about it. So this is where ancestry becomes relevant. We did some work. Um, we started off this work uh, with a colleague of mine uh, at University of Louisville, uh, Dr. Lucrece Kidd, uh, helped me understand. I'm a promoter basher by training. So um, helped me understand uh, the value of looking at uh, variants and SNPs in various populations. We published a couple of uh, pieces of work uh, with a magical um, gene list that I created. Um, and with that, we looked at uh, variants that were more, uh, the allele frequencies were higher in African-Americans than Europeans. So a lot of the GWAS work wasn't working when you would go back and apply those, those hits or potential hits with um, African-Americans. And so I came up with a list and said, oh, the problem is, is you know, probably need to look at those genes that are more common than black folks. I didn't know the complexity of GWAS at the time. And so we had a running list that I created. It was 100 plus um, variants. Uh, and we found a couple of those hits uh, were prevalent in breast cancer risk in African-American women. Most of these women were um, uh, triple negative. And one that interests us was IRAC-4. We got funded for that uh, later on in life. Um, we ended up migrating from that and brought in the list. Um, and we ended up with a couple more papers. Here are some of those papers um, relating to um, toe-like receptor signaling, uh, which is a review. Uh, we also looked at, oh, uh, the genetic variants related to um, prostate, cancer prostate cancer risk in um, men, Jamaican men, uh, that had uh, previously had sexually transmitted um, uh, infections, and did some other work with a case study of, of African descent. And we said African descent because we actually had two populations. We had one population of African American and one population of Jamaican, and we found out that uh, the SNPs were not, you didn't have the same impact between the two populations. So we had to separate them out. So that's why you hear me talking more from the perspective of uh, African-Americans, those here in the United States. There's a lot of admixture in the Caribbean that you are aware of, and that also varies per island. And each island has a certain um, ancestry or admixture. So that's the premise leading up to uh, this idea of, and that's the premise I used to a lot of my work. Um, so now the question is, you know, what would it look like if you actually design drugs or approach drug discovery from a different uh, perspective? So I was recently awarded well, myself and um, Kevin Williams and Dr. Um, Navarro, uh, Hernan, Hernan Navarro um, at North Carolina Central University with an R01 looking at putting ancestry into the mix. So, you know, when you start asking that question, what is drug discovery? What does it look like? Um, you have to ask the question about race and genetic ancestry. So we know, this is pulled up recently, um, this is the participation, per percent participation in clinical trials by subpopulations of new molecular entities. And these are drugs in 2020. You know, it's 8% Black, 6 Asian, 11%. Hispanic. Half of those studies were done in the United States. Okay. You notice that 75% are Europeans. If you 
break that down a little bit and I hope this comes out. Oops. Let's see, let's go back. If you look at um, the drugs here for breast cancer, the last two columns, and you see there's only seven and 9% have African-American women in them. And yet the mortality is higher in those um, in black women than in Europeans. Even though Europeans have a slightly higher increase in incidence, they have a um, better outcome um, uh, in the clinic. So here's a case where race Everyone realizes that you know it's nice to have everyone included in these clinical trials, but now you don't have them represented. So now you have to ask the question, wow, how did we get there? And I also asked some folks, I said, well, if you look at the world populations of major regions, and they did this, and I got this um, from the demographics, and they got the information from the United Nations, 1950, 2015, and you notice how the orange and red are growing. You also realize that if you look at North America in green and in Europe, okay, you realize that, wow, most of the planet is brown or other, okay? So, but they're not in the studies, okay? They're not in the studies. So how do you, how do you address that? Now, there was one drug that was put out before um, uh, Bidel, the big Bidel story, everyone talks about Bidel. And this is the one drug that's been approved for self-identified black patients, okay? Yet when I go out in the community, those that um, um, are on this drug, it's only a handful. The communities I go out are out in uh, Halifax County in North Carolina, predominantly uh, African-American populations, rural populations, a lot of diversity out there. Um, they, they were rated, they were rated very low on the health scale of all the counties, 100 counties. They're like, they were 99 for a long time, okay? And I realized that some people had, didn't even know about the drug. And yet some of them had um, hypertension, some of them had heart issues, but none of them had even never heard the name. So here's a case where race was the basis for the drug, not ancestors. But we wanted to address that a little differently. So we want to apply the ancestry piece. We thought that would be interesting because I was asking the guys at the um, at Bright Institute, what cell lines do you guys use? What do you do? You think about those variants when you design these drugs? I asked a couple of the pharmaceutical companies when I would go to the conferences, and some of their uh, medical liaisons said, "You know, no one's ever asked that. Uh, I never thought about that." And because you think about the fact that many of the drugs are designed against the wild type version of a protein, that wild type is probably has a, a higher allele frequency in the Europeans and not necessarily the other groups, the other um, ancestors. So here's a case of showing you those uh, a thousand plus cancer cell lines. And here in the green and the red, this is the, the discussion of, this is showing you the um, ancestry, the number of cells in that population of, 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 of cancer. And that cancer population these are, so here is, is breast cancer. There are uh, 51 cell lines in the breast cancer cell line, and most of them are red, which is European. Here's African in the bottom, and then East Asian, uh, and then you have South Asian, and then Native American. So most, most of the drugs, most of the cell lines are actually European cell lines. Some people say, oh, who cares? I've had that discussion as well. Oh, uh, we've had one case I, was, I mentioned earlier, um, there's no ancestry in cell lines. I said, okay. And then we had discussion about why does it make a difference? Well, we published a paper in conjunction with Rick Tittles. Um, we published a nice paper talking about that one question, asking about the ancestry in the cell lines. This is 2019. Remember, the, um, when we started talking about ancestral markers way before 2019, but no one applied it to the, to the cell lines. And so at that time, there was a cell line that was running around and everyone was using it. And that cell line is in red here, E006AA. This was a cell line that was said to be African-American. And people, you would go to meetings and they would have this cell line and they would be on their posters and be in their talks 
And that cell line was so drastic. It was so aggressive. And it was, oh my goodness, it was horrible cell line. Hard, just horrible. Those, those black folks have some bad prostate cancer, right? Come to find out it's European. Dr. Kittles got a whole bunch of nasty emails following this paper. And even though we were supposed to be co-last author, only his email appeared on the document. So that was a good move. Um, and then we had a couple of other cell lines that were looked at, and that's 468, which turned out to probably be a Hispanic because of the high Native American. Okay. And so they were done by two scientists in, in Rick's lab. So here's an example of misrepresentation. For years, for years, uh, and NIH funding also was dumped into these projects that had EEO6, and it was discussed for years. That everyone kind of knew it. People had already done the work, and yet it was still allowed to persist. Okay, until now, all the papers related to this um, um, cell line have been um, um, re redacted, taken out, and uh, even um, ATCC. Uh, realized that after they went back and looked at it again, oh, wow, it's renal. So it wasn't even the right cell line, cell type. So this comes to what my grant and, um, is about. I did something very simple. I actually went through and decided that I'm going to look at the um, genome aggregation database, and I'm going to pull out every variant in that database that is greater than 25%, the allele frequency is greater than 25% African versus European, okay? Therefore, I'm looking at variants that are gonna be shifted, of course, to European, to African-American or African. And then I'm gonna look at those and then select out of those a list of immune-related genes and then select out of those, those that might be druggable, okay? And then we're approaching that through so to some functional assays, we do CRISPR. Um, and then we're gonna do, uh, look at it in four different cell lines. Two of the cell lines are um, African-American and two cell lines are European. Okay, I'm gonna describe those a little later. We're also gonna do some interesting uh, media conditions. You know, when you think about comorbidities, um, some drugs, there's no human being that's gonna look like a tissue culture media, right? This perfect media that's been precise. So a couple of things we decided to look at and we've included in our analysis is high sugar, diabetic, and also high lipid. To ask the, fact, to ask the question, does the drug or does this have a different impact in these two different environments? Okay. We also have one related to stress, the presence of norepinephrine, epinephrine, and cortisol. Right now we're kind of working out conditions for norepinephrine and we're finding out that it's already been reported that norepinephrine has an impact on IC50s. I'm gonna show you some uh, first round of data that we have looking at that. Uh, and we know that that was done originally, believe it or not, mostly in 231 cells, which are a European cell line, okay? We then will do, of course, the phenotypic char characterization with seahorse and incusite. Um, we also are taking those, um, those clones, those uh, genes that we identified, and we're doing gateway uh, cloning. By the way, we're also knocking in um, the variant if uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. We're trying to work out some basic conditions for the CRISPR, um, but we have uh, plans to knock in some of those variants that we find to be relevant, uh, those genes that are relevant. Uh, we go gateway cloning. If you guys are not familiar, the, 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 the new schoolers might not know this. The old school gateway technology is a homologous recombination. You can do it all in one like in 30 minutes, 40 minutes, it's really neat. And then you can do a bunch at once. So we can do up to um, 30 clones. No, I'm sorry, 16 um, um, clones at one time into five different vectors, each of those clones, really nice. We've gotten that worked out and we're even uh, working out, getting that to work on some of our robots over at um, Bright. We're also working on assay development. Um, that's the expertise of Bright. And then of course, we do some in silico modeling and silico modeling and screening uh, in house, ultimately leading to a chemical library screen. To give you some idea, we've all gone in and looked at and verified the ancestry of the cell lines. The cell lines in yellow are reflective of um, are reflective of 
the cell lines we use in our studies, 1806, African-American, 80%, 468 is 80%. And 231 is the famous 231s everyone uses for triple negative. Um, and we also have gone down to 1143s as well. We try to find uh, another TNA, um, triple negative um, A and B, other two different subtypes. Uh, this is the only caveat in our work is that 231s happen to be TNA, T, triple negative B. So I want to get back to that stress piece. We have a, a young lady working in the lab now, um, Elena, uh, Dr. Le um, well, she gave her a degree early. Um, Elena Burrell is working on looking at um, the impact of uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and some of the inhibitors and inducers of the beta androgenetic receptors. And uh, we know that chronic stress has been, uh, is related to that structural racism, okay? The idea being that um, even though my phenotype might, allude, might lend me to more uh, um, stress than my colleagues, um, that chronic stress would mean elevated levels possibly of norepinephrine. What's been interesting that some of the publications that we found actually was that it wasn't that the African-American uh, samples had um, high, uh, um, high levels of, of norepinephrine, they actually had a higher level of the receptors, not necessarily high levels of the hormone, which was kind of interesting. So I've only found one paper to look at that. But our idea is that why not ask that question? Does norepinephrine have an impact? Um, some preliminary work, uh, these are the IC50s, uh, and you see uh, with no epinephrine, uh, norepinephrine, you add it, and you see in some of the cases, 231s, so the African-Americans are the red, and you see a change uh, due to 10 um, um, micromolar of, uh, which seems like a lot of norepinephrine, but apparently we found a couple of papers that that is the local concentration of norepinephrine in some of the ovarian cancers uh, that they found in, in vivo. So I said, well, toss it on there and we'll see. And that's what most of the publications are using. Um, we also find some change just as low as 0 0.003. You see there's a slight difference and you get more of a response in the European cell lines than you do the African-American cell lines. A change in the IC50, which would be a change in the efficacy, right? As I mentioned to you before, we are looking at um, um, uh, using gateway technology. We're looking at not only uh, the variants, these are two variants here, and then wild type, we put them into, in this case, two vectors, P-17 and P-30. One is a, a eukaryotic expression vector that can be induced with um, uh, doxycycline, and another one can be induced with IPTG. Uh, we can now use that to produce a histag protein and create an assay for that. Another one is to look at that stably uh, in cell line that has the receptor or doesn't have the receptor, and ask the question, uh, what is the impact on the behavior of the cell? What's neat about that and why I use IL-4, Dr. Ariel Williams um, actually discovered for her thesis, one of the papers she published was looking at the levels of circulating uh, cytokines uh, in uh, uh, women, African-American women uh, who, were a BMI, who had a BMI over 30 and had elevated A1C. So this was a case match study. You see the numbers are, are very low. Um, we did a case match. They were all over 30 um, BMI. And we found that just because the sugar was high, their blood sugar was higher, we actually could find a higher level of some cytokines that were not the traditional cytokines. So I don't like to chase TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, interleukin-6. Uh, I'm kind of bored to death with those. Same guys, everyone recycles them. There's a lot more out there, right? Uh, and so we, we have kind of, attach ourselves to IL-3, 4, and 7. What's interesting enough, IL-3 has a uh, variant that is um, found in the actual IL-3 interleukin itself that is common among African-Americans. It is hypothesized that, that has an effect on binding to the receptor. IL-4, it's not IL-4 itself that has the variant, IL-4 receptor, and that's what we've latched on to. IL-4 receptor, I'll show you some of the things that it's involved in. And IL-7 also has a, a variant that um, actually increases the amount of soluble IL-7 receptor, which would act uh, as a protective mechanism. 
just to show you the importance of targeting IL-4, there's a couple of papers out talking about the role of IL-4 in cancer therapy, IL-4 in breast cancer. So it became an interest of us even more. We also have another parallel study looking at liver and, um, and lipogenesis. Uh, if you look at knockout mice with IL-4, they respond to high fat diet differently than a wild type mouse. Uh, so there's mouse models that, that confer uh, the relevance of IL-4. Uh, there's breast cancer observations related to IL-4 and IL-13. Um, and that pathway uh, looks uh, different between two different cell lines. So if you look at lymphoid cells, you find that IL-4 uh, has a, a gamma chain and its IL-4 alpha receptor is signals through that pathway, but we're not looking at uh, lymphoid cell line cells. We're actually looking at epithelial cells. And so we're looking at this path and almost all the variants that are found in uh, our list that are uh, have a higher frequency in African-Americans are actually found in the kinase domain. Okay. A linear map gives you a description of that. And you find that those variants are listed here. The, I call it 275 and the uh, 5015 happen to be the ones that we really like because um, they actually change. Uh, um, one is to a, a proline um, and another one's a change as a charge change. And they're located once again in the kinase domain. And they have shown to be relevant in various other um, studies. One related to hypercholesterolemia, uh, cholesterolemia, I'll get it right. And um, other ones related to um, glioma and another one related to asthma, okay? Now, mind you, some of these variants are highly uh, prominent in the African-American population. The, two, the 515, the 5015 is a serine to a proline in a case study where that's related to um, um, uh, skin issues as well as uh, drug resistance um, to parasites. So, IL-4 becomes important. So that's one of the first ones that we started with. We, of course, um, characterized the cell lines. We even looked at um, B1, B2, and B3 related to norepinephrine receptors, looked at their status. Remember that um, these two, excuse this, um, uh, these two are the African-American cell lines and these two are the European. And it's interesting that some of the genotypes don't always line up like you would expect. Um, but, uh, and these are the frequencies uh, that are found in the populations, not necessarily in the cell lines. Um, you see, in some cases, they are more prominent in um, Asian Americans, European Americans, excuse me, in European Americans and, Af and African Americans. We have another protein that we're looking at. These are IL-4s here. Some of those variants are not found at all. However, you see here 70%, 38, 32, um, very high percentage um, uh, allele frequencies. And here's a protein of my, this is a passionate, a long standing uh, project of mine, stick one, and just, I just left it on the list because I like seeing it every once in a while. Um, and that's related to a oncogene that we played with as an estrogen receptor beta responsive gene. So, um, so lastly, uh, I want to share with you that we've done some of the, some of the work in terms of structure uh, this is in collaboration with um, Cambridge in England and um, the two Johns working with us, uh, just playing around with the structure to show you the impact of some of those variants that we talked about. Uh, the the 50, 15 is that serine to proline and the purple is reflective of that change. Here is a um, serine to an aniline and we have a change here and then you have the overlay. And so this lets you know that we're starting to look at this. This is new. Uh, we're working on the assay for IL-4R. Um, no one's done, at least we can't find a small molecule for, for IL-4R. Um, and we plan on drugging and we are working on um, um, introducing these variants into these cell lines, these breast cancer cell lines. We have some other behavior that is coming up. We've looked at uh, the impact of norepinephrine on wound healing. Uh, and we also have some data showing uh, the impact of, believe it or not, high glucose and doing wound healing in high glucose media, plus or minus IL-4. Some very interesting data coming out. They only did an N of one, so we're gonna wait and present that next time. Um, and you can see how that impacts. But our approach has really been, and our goal is to characterize 50 uh, immune-related genes and associated van uh, variants in an ancestral context. And what I mean by that 
sometimes it's hard to take a variant that you found in the population and just plug it into another population. It's context, okay? And that's what I want you to think about. I wanna leave you that idea of context that if you find a gene that is uh, works, uh, that is relevant in my situation or a risk gene, and you wanna ask it if that variant is functional or has an impact, if you found it in me, you might wanna look in me. It might not be the same if I put it into Eric and say, here you go, I'm gonna put that variant into Eric. It might not work, okay? It's not, it's out of context. And that, what we're referring to there is the possibility of gene-gene interactions. We're talking about cluster gene. If I'm optimized to handle uh, vitamin D differently because of my skin color, because I'm designed to be outside, then the context there needs to be considered. I've, I've gotten upset with folks when they write grants and they sit down and they put in there that, oh, I'm gonna take this gene here and I'm gonna put it in 231 cells. Well, that's not in context. If you found it in African-American, maybe you should put it at least try to put it in the ancestral context of the cell line as well. Just something to think about. Uh, we're also gonna char characterize those in different media conditions because in most cases, the drugs have a comorbidity. So that's asked the question, how does that drug act or does it act at all? Or does that gene or that variant have a different impact in a different uh, media condition that might be reflective of a high lipid diet or a high sugar diabetic or in high stress? Also, we're going to develop some assays for some genes and their variants for drug discovery. That would be novel. Most drug companies do not do that. And we're going to hopefully find some novel small molecules to target these ancestral SNPs, as I call them in these appropriate ancestral cell lines, okay? So keep in mind, I hope you leave here thinking about um, geographical ancestry as contextual. And that drug design, we can see is probably biased on the cell lines that they use, which are mostly European and not inclusive. And maybe take a twist and think about that a little differently in the future and include that idea that maybe I need to look at that in another context. I want. I always show this picture. This is my lab out in um, Tillery, North Carolina. Um, this is uh, 40 acres and a mule. You've heard that before. This is one of the sites that actually um, um, set that up and was experimentally trying how that how would that look if we gave 40 acres and a mule to uh, freed slaves and um, and so this is the site in Tillery. We do a lot of our collections and a lot of our uh, ex exchange of data and communications with that community. They've been very polite and very nice and tolerant of us coming out. Uh, it's about trust, it's about experience. Um, and it's nice to have a lab that comes out and they love the students to come out and, and engage. And so that's what we do. So we do not only at the bench, we take it all the way to out into the community and try to deliver that information. And these are the collaborators, um, NC Central and my lab, um, the lab techs, Kanisha Webb, Portia Andrews, both graduates of North Carolina Central, uh, Ezekiel, Abraham, Jordan, Danya, Ariel, as you know, left. She's here now. Um, Elena and Susan have been instrumental in really helping me write and get my stuff together. Um, as I said, the PIs on the R01 is uh, Hernan, Hernan Navarro and Kevin Williams and their labs and associated other relationships with Fox Chase, um, University of the West Indies, Bright, AC3, the African Consortium, um, uh, Caribbean Consortium, and of course, um, Cambridge. So I wanna thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that amazing seminar. You can maybe as easy as we just and um, we do have a few minutes for some questions. And uh, uh, Dr. Williams is going to take questions from online. And we'll just start off with one in the room uh, with Eric Green. Oh, great. And there's another microphone over there for anybody in the audience who wants to come to the microphones. Sean, thank you so much. Really insightful talk. Maybe think about a lot of things. One of the things I'd like to hear a little bit more from you about is your view on this, you know, horrifically difficult situation with the cell lines. 
because right. it's it's not even I mean this is a pervasive problem with cell lines in general and a lot of different features of cell lines but these are major conclusions that bring in with bring it into the fold societal you know considerations and it's just scientifically wrong because just which just seems so embarrassing because the level of sophistication of the studies being performed on those cell lines is an order of magnitude more complicated than just knowing the answer that you actually have the right ancestry associated with it. I mean, when you saw that data, have you given any thought of you know how we could try to systematically correct this or going forward, what should be sort of the norm? And well, cetera, I, don't dis I, I don't disagree with the possibility of acknowledging um, ancestry in in your as a requirement, and that they, that they, they want to prove the 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 origin of the cell lines all the time, right? They require that, especially for some of the um, some of the NIH grants. They actually require that that you actually confirm that it is the cell line that you're using. Um, but that doesn't that's not a confirmation of ancestry. It's a confirmation of whether or not it's a cancer, uh, a prostate cancer cell or a renal cell, but not ancestor. Or it could have been wrong from the very beginning. All wrong. you're doing is confirming it's 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 cell line one twenty five, which Correct. was originally what it was claimed to be. And if it was wrong then about something and, about ancestry. And that's and some of them don't have ancestry attached to them. Right. There are some public databases out there if you can screen from I can always send an email um uh, that are out there that, that have done some ancestry on some of the known um, cell lines that are out here. The ones that I showed you are mostly from the European base. I looked at, start looking at the NC60 uh, um, panel. Uh, most of those are European, it looks like, um, and there's only a handful of African American on there. I think it's going to be a quest also to get more cell lines created that are ethnically diverse. I think we've been working on PDX models. Oh, let's get the diverse PDX models. But you're talking about PDX models a lot of times in terms of putting them into a mouse. Now, we know that's not in context, right? But at the end of the day, um, that's what we're concentrating on. Maybe we need to set up some ideas just getting some real cell lines that are diverse. Uh, that's why I ended up chosen, chosen the breast cancer cell lines because of the diversity there that I couldn't find anywhere else. There are very little in the prostate cell lines, only like one or two. And that becomes problematic when you start making decisions on one or two cell lines that look like me. Can I ask one follow-up though? I mean, even if you say, all right, tomorrow your lab's going to create a cell line and my lab's going to create a cell line and we want to make sure the ancestry is properly associated in each case with those cell lines. Is there a sort of a gold standard now on what set of genomic markers to use or what? I mean, is that standardized? Well, not with a, really? with a, no. So because um, that could lead, because that could also downstream lead to incorrect assignments if yeah. people are making ancestry assignments based on different uh, different, different methods snips. and different yeah. markers and et cetera, et cetera. There is no, not that I'm aware of. Um, Rick uses his, and then uh, I know there's a couple other, uh, there's different programs as well. Yeah. Uh, so there's no standardized for that that I'm aware of. Yeah, okay. Okay, we have some questions in the chat um, as well. So I'm going to read some of those off. Um, an anonymous attendee said, how is the slave trade and your examples of forced lifestyle changes and environmental changes any different um, for any refugee today? They gave examples of the Moorish kingdom and um, slavery in the Mediterranean, um, the Viking community. Isn't this a continual problem regardless of race? If you look over time, where do you choose to start to look? And how do you control for such mixtures of the mixtures of the centuries? Okay, so a lot of those are not at the scale that we saw in slavery. And the time frame is a lot different. Okay. Um, and the divergent, um, uh, like I said, the introduction of two very divergent populations, there was what's the possibility that some guy in England was going to hang out? a whole 7 million people from England would have come down to Africa to hang out, right? Um, and so I think we need to approach that and think that, uh, I've heard that similar argument before, why this? Why that's so unique to this population? One, because of the size of that interaction. 7 million people over two continents, there is no other expansion of a people like that in that length of time with that level of admixing. And, it's, and in Brazil, it's even more complex with indigenous, okay? 
So I would argue that uh, why that why I, why slavery becomes unique is the fact that you just have so much so divergent genomes clashing together in a different environment. Uh, we're not talking about North Europe versus Middle Europe or Southern Europe. You're talking about Europe, England, um, or France, and we're talking about Central Africa. Also, um, there is uh, comments and questions from Anil Whaley. Dr. Kimbrough, very educational and informative, informational talk. Thanks for giving proper context and background for precision medicine, drug development strategies that will have profound impact on various organ-based cancers, uh, cancers clinical management. This transformational, translational research is very important if we plan to address and eliminate cancer health disparities. Thank you for sharing your research with us here at NIH. And they follow up with, should ancestry information markers be a requirement for ATC, ATCC cell line repositories? I think it should. Actually, I think they definitely should. Uh, they since pulled that cell line from HECC uh, and all the associated papers are also removed uh, related to that cell line development. The next um, question is how about applying the 25 passage restriction on the use of any cell lines? How do you feel about that? You know, I, I know that cell lines change over passage. I always tell the students uh, from my perspective, uh, that's just be very frank and understand that uh, if a cell can grow on a piece of plastic, we know darn well that's not normal. Right? And that's not what we're looking at. That's not about, you know, it's what we do to get the job done, to ask some basic questions. So I'm not been out of shape about the passage number. I do know, as long as you know that when it changes, it's time to go back to the pot. <laughs> um, but um, so I haven't really had too much of that problem that they've been around so long anyway by now. I don't know what to tell you. You know, when you isolate someone from the 1950s and 1960s, it's pretty messed up. <laughs> um, Dr. Charles Rotimi said, how do you define ancestry in your study? Also, given that African-Americans have multiple sources of ancestry, how do you take this into consideration in your studies? This is important because at a specific location in the genome, African-Americans may have European or African background. So what he's talking about is local ancestry. So I didn't show a picture. I had a, a picture that has a local ancestry for IL, for chromosome 12, which IL-4R is located. And all those people that were on that screen actually have different chromosome painting that looks really interesting, where you could see one person had a whole chromosome that was that had Asian ancestry. And so that would have a huge impact if you're looking for their variant of interest. Um, I defined ancestry at, uh, geographically based off of uh, a series of SNPs. Um, most of my ancestry was done through Rick Kittles, um, who's at Morehouse School of Medicine now. And um, so there's a set of SNPs, variants, that correlate with a particular region of the planet. Um, and so that's what I define as ancestry, not necessarily ancestry from where did you come from, uh, type of ancestry my folks came from. Uh, England or my folks came from. So part of my family, my heritage actually is from England and you can trace back all the way through. You, know, you, you have to use one of those other programs, like ancestry.com or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, so yeah, so I have a mixture of that when it comes to the at mixing. I do not use at ancestry as race. I think I've seen a lot of that going around and I've had a lot of debates. Um, uh, they want to say, uh, they want to use ancestry and say, look, it's, uh, I was telling the students today, uh, the word concordance. They check the box and they have Western African ancestry and they say, oh, they're concordant. And I said, no, so now you're telling me how black I am. And I tell them that that can be offensive, folks, because that's what they did in Louisiana and North Carolina and some other states where they tell you the percentage, you know, the one drop rule. So uh, we don't, we don't want to use ancestry to identify race. You want to look within that group and look at how ancestry impacts a particular outcome or a variant. So I'll have one last question from the chat in the interest of time. Dr. Kimbrough, very impressive talk. How is your research being used to improve drug development? So we hope that this would lead to first identifying some drugs that might impact other populations. If you assume that a drug is 
biased in this design, then let's take that some of that bias out and maybe include some other folks in the picture. By doing so, if you look at that, remember that, that pie chart, really, I, I had some people argue with me that um, I'm designing drugs for Black people. And I said, so what? Because at the end of the day, you know, why not design drugs for most of the planet? And most of the planet is black and brown or other. So here's an opportunity to design drugs that impact possibly a broader group of people globally. Thank you very much, Dr. Kimbrough, for this insightful talk. I have two questions for you. First question is basically related to the issue. What is the distribution of your candidate variants in immune genes, for example, in people of African um, American ancestry versus people of African ancestry from West Africa? Have you looked into that? Because so, you gave us the allele frequency compared, you know, IL-4 variants, for example, in African American versus Asian versus European, etc. But I just wonder whether these variants have been under positive or negative evolutionary selection, for example. So, so in the African populations uh, on this particular database, um, they're very close. The African-American and African are very close. Or even if you go to the thousand genomes, the numbers are very close. African-Americans usually have a slightly lower uh, allele frequency because of the, the admixture, I, I, right. I presume. Um, so a lot of these are, uh, are really an African ancestral variants in, in that population I'm looking at for African-Americans. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, when you talk about using these cell lines and you know using them in the context of these genetic variants, et cetera, again, I wonder why don't you have in your study, for example, a breast cell line from Western African you know, people, again, to compare right. what is the effect of nurture versus the effect of right. nature. So there are none that were um, greater than 80% of West African ancestry that we huh. could find. That was the highest we had was 80%. And so that's the cell line that we were working with. Um, and, 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 and so I don't disagree with you that, yes, it would be better, you would think, to have a cell line that had 90, 95% West African. Uh, I don't have such a cell line. I'll have to talk to some of my colleagues to see if they have established any. No, I was actually, what I meant to say is, can you get some cell line from West oh, Africa? That's what I right. meant to say. Um, so yeah, so I'll probably have to kind of, a couple of my colleagues actually have um, great collaborations uh, in Africa, and they might actually have some cell lines. Yeah, I think that's nice, good to yeah, have for this experiment. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Kimbrough. Okay. Well, you have provoked a lot of great ideas that I hope we will all take with us into the future. And wanted to thank you uh, again for visiting us today at NHGRI and for kicking off our seminar series. So thanks so pleasure. much. And um, with that, we'll conclude the seminar. Thanks. Thank you.